Hello and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. We are in the heart of our Women in Conservation Science series, and today's conversation is as heartwarming as it is educational. In this episode, we are sitting down with Frida Laura, PhD, shark expert, tour guide, and co-founder of Orcas. Frida grew up with a strong love of the sea and always knew she wanted to become a marine biologist when she grew up. During school, she studied all kinds of marine wildlife, but found her true calling when she had the opportunity to perform revolutionary shark research in Baja, California, Mexico. After a series of events that I'll let her explain to you, she became an ocean tour guide leading people on underwater safaris, which eventually led to her co-founding the NGO Orcas with 11 other amazing women and partnering with a local community to help them develop a nature-based tourism program as an alternative livelihood to shark hunting. Frida and I have such a delightful conversation chatting about the different types of research she performed in her early years as a marine biologist, how she became a shark researcher, what she discovered studying Galapagos sharks and silky sharks, how the NGO Orcas came to be and her role within the organization, the difference between artisanal and commercial shark hunting, the power of community-based tourism for ocean conservation, and a truly wild encounter with a tiger shark that you won't want to miss. All right, everyone, please enjoy my chat with Frida. Well, hi, Frida. Thank you so much for sitting down with me in the Rewildology community today and sharing your incredible story and just everything that you've done since the beginning of your career. But of course, there was a day one for you. This didn't just happen out of nowhere. So tell me, tell everyone listening, why marine biology? What is your story that has led you to what you're doing today? Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard because I, I don't remember, actually. <laughs> uh, I was very, very, very young, probably when I decided that. My dad wanted to be an oceanographer. So since I was a baby, I remember all my holidays were related to the ocean. And when I was seven, uh, my dad was a diver, so he took me um, to the boat. And I remember like the feeling of having the regulator in my mouth and like just floating and seeing fishes and stuff. And then I think from there, I was in love from the ocean. And yeah, it came very naturally. Like when I was 17, I finished my high school. And in my town, we didn't have marine biology. So I had to move to a different city. And I went to the south of Mexico in Yucatan to study the, the Bachelor in Marine Sciences. And yeah, that's how everything started. <laughs> the seed was planted at a young age which is, yes. is awesome mm. I've come to find that either those of us in this field it was like from the moment we remember or it's like I don't know I stumbled into this it doesn't <laughs> seem to be much yeah. in between <laughs> but all my friends from like elementary school they always say that I always say that I wanted to be a marine biologist like mm. they remember more clearly than I but yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great yeah Okay, so then after high school, so you went to the Yucatan Peninsula, which is wonderful, such a biodiverse, beautiful area. So yeah. then what did you do after that, which was quite a lot? So just take us through yeah, that, yeah. take you through your journey. So when I was doing the bachelor, I had the chance to work in the Caribbean. So I was monitoring some reefs for some projects. And I learned a lot. I, every time I, there was an opportunity for participating as a volunteer, as a student for any kind of project, I was in. <laughs> so I, I studied through like from parasites in fishes to all kind of stuff. And a lot of it was uh, related to diving. So I got a lot of experience diving and like doing transects, counting fish and all that. And yeah, I, I was pretty sure that I wanted to to be focused on some, something that was related to monitoring or like assessing the biodiversity in places like in coral reefs. And uh, then I did my master uh, in marine ecology and environmental management. 
in that time, my family had to move from Mexico to Europe. And oh. actually, I'm part Mexican and part Polish, even that oh, I don't no. look very really? Polish. <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. So, <laughs> so my family was uh, moving to Poland, and I wanted to be close to them. So I found this program in England that was six months in London, six months in Scotland, and a course uh, for a month in Egypt that was Whoa. just on, on Coral Reef. So I was like, this is perfect. I, I have the chance to travel to visit my family two hours from home. And and yeah, I, I really liked the program because it was like very like moving around and like getting to know other places, working with different researchers. And this is how I met my supervisor. Uh, I went to Egypt. It was really beautiful. A lot of the people in the program were not very experience on diving and like monitoring reefs but in that time I already had some experience so my professor uh, offered me the opportunity to do an internship in Daros in the Seychelles and that's how <laughs> I started doing ROPS so in my PhD actually is based on ROPS and yeah that's how I ended up moving around and doing more like uh, shark science Wow, I didn't know you went yeah. to Egypt and that you're also <laughs> Polish. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That is yeah, so yeah. incredible. Okay, okay. So, okay, so you're doing, it sounds like you were doing a lot of just like anything you could that was underneath the water, a lot of coral, just coral stuff, maybe some more yeah. biodiversity stuff. So you just hinted at sharks entering your life, which that is the main topic of today. So we've mm -hmm. gone to sharks, but... I've come to find that you don't just stumble upon or just like fall into shark research. So how exactly did that happen for you? And then what did you end up studying for your PhD? Cause you had quite an interesting research topic that you looked into. Yeah. So what, yeah. How, how, how sharks? <laughs> well, there is a lot of people that always were in love of sharks and I always loved them, but they were not my main focus of interest. At the beginning, I was like studying starfish, sea urchins, uh, reef fish. I love all biodiversity in general. So I was studying like very tiny little animals to like something bigger. But when this supervisor told me like, we have this opportunity to go to Seychelles and we are going to monitor sharks there. I actually was kind of nervous because I didn't know if I actually wanted to work with sharks. Mm. So for my birthday, I gave to myself <laughs> a dive in, in Playa del Carmen. And that was like the first time that I dove with sharks and interact with sharks very close. And I was in love. I was like, this is the kind of things that I want to do. And also because when you study biodiversity in general and like ecology, you realize how important sharks are because they are on the top of the food chain. So basically, whatever it happened to them is going to affect the whole ecosystem. So I was like, if, if I'm able to start working with these top predator animals, then I'm helping the whole ecosystem. And I always found a lot of interest on behavior and evolution. Like I always, like in my master thesis, I was studying behavior and like reading a lot of books about behavior. And sharks are like the perfect example of how evolution and behavior are key for being a top predator, no? So, yeah, it was very interesting to see how they relate to each other and like how species adapt to different environments. So, yeah, that, that was like my main um, interest. And in the internship, we, we use this, this technique that is called props. That means a uh, baited remote underwater video stations. <laughs> And basically are uh, just a GoPro uh, with a stick and a little bit of bait in a container. And you put them in different places, like you can put them close to the bottom to see animals that are close to the reef, or you can just let them drift in the blue, in the column of the water, and find other like pelagic species like marlin or like yellowfin tuna or sharks that are not related to the reef. And yeah, it's very, very interesting to see that. So basically I spent hours and hours analyzing videos from <laughs> different places. And okay, well, one, that's super cool. I had never even heard of this technique until you told mm -hmm. me about it, which yeah. is awesome. Talk about a cool, like non-invasive way 
of exactly. studying everything. Cause I mean, a camera is a camera. So I'm sure you captured a lot of stuff, not just sharks, but yeah. if we want to stay on more of the shark, what, what were your findings? And then also maybe where, where did you launch all of these cameras? Where was your focus site? And what did you, what did you find? Well, for my PhD, I, I actually, it was, Interesting because I, I went to Mexico City with my sister. It was her graduation. Uh, she's a doctor. So I saw this talk that my supervisor was giving in, in, a, in, like in a dive shop in Mexico City, like super random. But I saw that he was talking about bull sharks in, in the Caribbean and everything. And I was like, I want to go. And I went with my sister and I, I normally don't talk to presenters because I'm kind of shy, <laughs> but that day I was like, my sister was like, no, you have to go and, and introduce yourself. So I went with Mao and I say like, ah, hi, nice to meet you, Mao. Uh, I, I just came back from Seychelles and I, I learned this technique that is very, very useful and we haven't used it in Mexico. And maybe you are interested and we can talk about it. And he said like, yes, I really like that idea. I have a project that is starting in Revilla Gijedo in Socorro Island. So, yes, yeah, send me an email. And that's how everything started. So uh, I start talking to Mao. Uh, we start, like, discussing the ideas. And basically what we were trying, it, it was to find distribution patterns. So basically how sharks are using a national park or an archipelago. So you have four islands in this park, and in each place you have different environments. You have, like, very, very flat sandy bottoms that are perfect now we know for tiger sharks so we found tiny little baby tiger sharks that are almost impossible to see diving because they are super super shy and we found like steep walls full of silky sharks now so, so we start like seeing how all these species because in mexico reviejado is called the mexican galapagos because it's super diverse we find around 20 species of sharks in in each of the dive sites so seeing how they share the environment no and how they use it and where you find the juveniles where you find the adults just by using the cameras so it was a very powerful technique and i spent basically four years going every month to deploy the cameras and in different places you you cannot select specific areas you can have like some samples in each island but it has to be random. So basically you put them everywhere <laughs> and you start like seeing patterns, no? Like some areas are more diverse. You have like more, like I see them like airports, no? So you have some international airports that are super busy with more species. And then you have areas that are not diverse and they are like more quiet and not a lot of fish and sharks. So yeah, it was really, really interesting. But at the same time, I was feeling like, there was not enough that for a project that was four years long, I felt like we had to include something else to tell the story. So that's why I asked Mao and, and my supervisor to use other kind of technique. And I, I combined the information that we had from the cameras with telemetry. So we were using all the data from sharks that were tagged in Revilla Gijedo and seeing how they were traveling from Revilla to the other marine reserves in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So we have data from Cocos, Clipperton, Galapagos, Malpelo, all these places, no? And it was really cool because they, the researchers in the other countries allow me to use the information to start seeing these connectivity patterns, no? So we have connectivity that can be related to the, the genes. So it's genetic connectivity, but we also have physic, physical connectivity. So real movements of animals traveling between each place and each marine reserve. So yeah, in, in the PhD, basically, I use tons and tons of detections of silkies and Galapagos sharks and seeing how they were moving between each of the, of the areas on each of the island. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, have two, <laughs> I have two questions. Yeah. One, the first one, I want to go back to your airport analogy, which I thought was yeah. so, so fun. A big, yeah. you know, Heathrow or, you know, LAX yeah, exactly. or these, these big J&B, these massive international airports that everyone has to fly through whether or not they want to. You got to go through that massive airport to get to that part of the world. Exactly. Or a little local one that has like three gates and you're super bored exactly. twiddling your thumbs. Mm. So what's the difference when you were starting to look at the data? 
why were there shark or like why were there underwater international airports and why were there just like little ones of where there really wasn't much action going on was there anything obvious that was the difference between the activity or was it temporal was it different times of year or why were why was the wildlife using these different spots differently from what you found so to determine that, I use network analysis that basically are the same as what we use sometimes for internet or like servers, where you put dots and each dot is one of the dive sites or one of the receivers. So I had like literally networks of different movements between the sharks and how they were like traveling between each of the places. And then you can find bigger circles or bigger airports. <laughs> and then the <laughs> smallest ones are the ones that they don't travel that much. And what what we have two options. One is that naturally some areas are more diverse and they have like steep walls or like a lot of current. So for example, Darwin Arch in Galapagos is that kind of a specific place that has cleaning stations, it has a lot of prey, it's a perfect place for adults to hang out and reproduce. So you have these seamounts or places that are uh, with a lot of productivity and obviously sharks can get advantage of being around the, that area and you can have other places that are like more stable like sandy bottoms that probably have less current and probably less praise for the sharks so they don't spend a lot of time in those places and the other thing is also the impact the human impact so mm. you can have areas that have been strongly impacted by for example, trolling or uh, industrial fishing, where you have less prey and or is already impacted by by this different um, destruction, no? the habitat destruction. So these places could be less important by through the time, no. So, for example, here in the Gulf of California, we have a very famous seamount that is called El Bajo. El Bajo, back in the 70s, used to be even better than Galapagos, like. Tons wow. and tons of sharks. Like in a normal dive, you could see schools of 200 hammerheads. <gasps> and nowadays, uh, it's almost empty. Like you don't see any shark. And what we found it is that in the 90s, the Mexican government allowed industrial fishing to come and catch everything. Even like Japanese or people from other countries were allowed to come and catch sharks there because we thought we had a very, very diverse and a rich environment that never will empty so mm. we allow them to catch with huge nets a lot of sharks and now obviously the species had some consequences of that and it's, it's slowly recovering we are seeing more and more sharks but it's not the same as it used to be so now we know that we have to protect this area and Revilla Gijedo where I did the PhD is a perfect example of like large fully and highly protected areas where no fishing is allowed and what it happens is that the environment has a chance to recover and then help the other environments or the areas outside to to also recover. So actually the industrial fishing is like getting more yellowfin tuna and the sharks inside that area are getting bigger and healthier so they can travel to other places and recover other airports. <laughs> <laughs> I love that description. <laughs> oh it's yeah. so good it's so good yeah where's all the action happening like sharks yeah. want to be there i don't i don't blame them so uh, and and next continuing on to that it's all part of the same all of your research the what movement patterns did you find well okay okay i have a question and a question so <laughs> you, you mentioned that you, you you focus on silky sharks and galapagos sharks yeah. which why those two species i mean i know when it comes to research you got to focus on something otherwise you're just like you you'll be there for the rest of your life trying to figure out all the sharks everything and we have to graduate with a phd at some time so why those two sharks and maybe some cool facts about them if you wouldn't mind sharing and then what did you find how were they moving around how were they using this the air your research area in their airports accordingly yes yeah, so for the phd we selected two species that were present in all the national parks in the area in the region so galapagos and silky sharks are present in the gulf of california obviously in revilla Gijedo, but they are also present in clipperton and in the galapagos we have other species for example dusky sharks 
they they are not very common in the southern part of the of the eastern tropical pacific so and silver tips they don't tend to go to the shore areas to the coastal areas so we needed to find two species that were present in all the national parks because potentially they had the chance to travel between the different places. So these two species are, silky sharks are one of the most caught species in the world. They, they, they catch tons and tons of silky sharks because it's a pelagic species. So they tend to be very related to yellowfin tuna. And obviously they are target for the industrial fishing boats. So uh, for example, there is a study from FAO that shows that for every ton of tuna, they catch around 100 silky sharks. Mm. And some of the crew in these tuna fishing boats caught the fins and they, they sell these fins for the Asian market. So it's not the target for the boat, but they still are doing a huge impact for the species. And it, yeah, it was interesting to have a very pelagic species that we knew it was traveling a lot. If you see the anatomy, they are travelers. Like, Mm. The fins are very long and very elongated, so that means that they are made and designed for traveling. And then you have Galapagos sharks that are more like isolated. They normally tend to be more in, in these uh, oceanic islands, and they travel, but they are more resident most of the time. So we wanted to compare two species that had different patterns. And what was very surprising was that we were able to see how sharks were traveling Obviously, between the Gulf of California to, to Revilla Gigedo, but also from Revilla Gigedo to Clipperton and then Galapagos. So they can do migrations of 3,000 kilometers. Wow. And the, the other interesting thing is why they do it, no? Yeah. So we think it's a lot about connectivity, no? So if you have different genes and different populations, then your population is stronger. So probably the, the females are moving and the males are moving between different countries and different reserves just to have that diversity of genes between different places. So cool. So cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that makes that makes total sense why you chose those different species. That 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 was really helpful. Thank thanks for exploring that. And you also just mentioned something, just these different lifestyles and that these sharks just naturally adopt. Like this is just how they evolve. Like, you know, the silky shark sounds like they're more in open ocean versus the Galapagos sharks, which may be more resident and near things. And we had this long conversation the last time you and I sat down and I would love if you could talk about it a little further. So we talked a lot about the open sea, the open ocean versus coastal regions and how these have very different consequences for both conservation and lifestyle and just all this stuff when it comes to sharks. Could you possibly explain this a little further? Why? Because, you know, we think of the big blue and everything that's in it is just dealing with the same shit, but that's not actually the case at all. So what is the difference for sharks that are in the open ocean versus coastal regions? And is one of these groups having more issues than the other, or are they both just not doing well? Well, yes, as, as you say, um, <laughs> what we have found is that most of the species are already not doing very well. Like 70% of the sharks in, around the world are on under kind of a, a risk of a, a extinction. And this is because the huge impact that we have, especially from the industrial fishing, that is affecting many of the key areas where the sharks are reproducing or feeding or doing something part of their life cycle. We have seen, for example, that hammerheads, they use a lot of the mangroves or the shallow areas to grow. And then when they get big enough, they start swimming and going through like more oceanic islands or sea mounts where they can find bigger prey and also find a mate. But what we found is that sometimes, is, especially in Mexico, it's easier to protect big areas in the oceanic uh, environment because uh, it was just used by industrial fishing, but there were not other stakeholders. And it was easy to, to work with the government and try to deal with the industrial fishing and find an agreement with them to protect a huge area. But when we talk about coastal communities and protecting areas where you have thousand fishermen relying on that resource, it's a different story. So 
what we found in the last years is that we also need to protect the coastal areas because a lot of the species are coming here in the Gulf of California to give birth and have the babies. And the babies rely a lot into, into mangroves and the shallows. So now that's how the second part of my work is, is now is to focus on working with the coastal communities and trying to find ways where they understand the importance of the area and we find ways to have new opportunities for them so they can help us to conserve the sharks. Ah, you totally picked up what I was putting down. <laughs> <laughs> that was a transitionary question. Yeah. Uh, you got it. So, but before, I mean, we both know what's coming next, but <laughs> the amazing listener doesn't yet. So, okay, you have this amazing research that you're doing. You are, you know, deploying these really cool cameras and then your PhD ends and you have this in-between area. So what, what was this transitionary period? What did you do for a while? And then why did you decide to leave that? to start this very exciting new thing that you are currently very deep and invested in. So what is the next stage after you got your PhD? So when I finished the PhD, I worked for the NGO where I, Mauricio and James NGO. For two years, I was the data analyst. So I was curating their data. So basically ordering all the information, because imagine if you have 300 shark stacks, uh, for 10 years, you have millions and millions of data <laughs> and you have to go through all of them and organize them somehow, no? So you can have a lot of data, but if you don't understand why you take it and how you can analyze it, it's not worth it. <laughs> like it's <just> there. <laughs> So that was my work. I was putting all the folders, putting all this information uh, in order and then be able to extract the most that uh, your questions no about the seasonality about the spatial differences so that was my work for a long time but then i was missing the part of being in the ocean so i was getting more into the part of uh, being the manager and administrator for the date and the ngo and everything and i was super passionate i really love it and i understand why it was important but I was missing being in the ocean. <laughs> so at that point, I decided to finish my contract. And then I worked during that. I decided that just before the pandemic. So then the pandemic came. I didn't have a job. And I was like, Aww. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> like, not very wise. <laughs> but None of us saw that coming. Time. So you can't yeah. be too hard on yourself for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I, I start, I, I'm a dive master, so I had the chance to take people out and show them everything, no? the nature. And especially in that time, we were surrounded by many species that normally we don't see. So we found many species of whales, many species of mantas, well, some species of mobulas and mantas. And yeah, so basically for a year and a half, I was guiding, taking people out. And teaching them about the species, no? Because having the advantage of not being a marine biologist and knowing why it's important to protect them, I had the chance to educate others, no? That work with me and they wanted to know more about why we were seeing these species and everything. So I tried to mix both. And yeah, that's, that's how I ended up doing a lot of ecotourism for after, well, during the pandemic and after that. And that's how things came later. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I absolutely love that connection. So uh, those that have been listening for a while know, and maybe those who haven't been listening that are brand new. So that's actually what I do. And one of the reasons why I was unbelievably excited to sit down with Frida here, because I'm a conservation biologist and use tourism as a tool for conservation. And so that we came to this the exact same way. I'm a trained scientist and I'm like, wow, we can take people to these wild places and make them care as much yeah. as we do because we have the knowledge to share with them. So that, yes, so that's really cool. And the perfect <laughs> transition to what yeah. came next. So I don't want to spoil it. I want you to do um, it. So you tell me and tell those listening, what what's the big thing that came to be after that? And how exactly did all the pieces come together to build what you're currently working on? 
Yeah, so in that time, I I had like, this group of friends. Some of them are drummers, some of them are managers, lawyers, everything. And they were all related to the ocean. We were good friends, all divers. It came to be that all of us were women in that moment. And we had one, one night a dinner with some friends. And, and one of them told us that, why not to start an NGO? Uh, because we were all related to the ocean and we were very worried about the conservation of the place so we're like yeah let's let's do it now and in that time this group of, of women organized themselves and start working with the community okay so i remember that was in july in july well in mexico we have a fishing ban that uh, last three months so in these three months we are not able to well uh, is not allowed to catch or sell any kind of fish uh, of sharks and rays. So we had this fishing ban for three months. And I remember going diving to this famous seamount uh, two hours from home and seeing 20 silky sharks every time we were going there, taking photos and doing all that. And it was beautiful, but at the same time, it was sad because we knew that when the fishing ban was over, they will be able to catch them legally. And we're like, no, like we were so like happy and at the same time, like desperate because we were like, we know reality. If this is totally normal. We don't like it, but we have to do something, no? And the first thing we, we decided to do was to look for the fishermen camp that currently are catching sharks and talk to them just to see how they are doing, if they need some help and negotiate with them to know what are the solutions. And this is how we started the NGO. ORCAS, <laughs> that is uh, Organization CAS, is a, is a game of, of the words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it started like that because we, we had this community, it's called Aguamarga. It's a community that is uh, one hour um, south from La Paz. And uh, we are currently working with 10 fishermen that are catching sharks. So the idea was to propose them a way to transition it from shark fishing to other economic activities like uh, nature-based tourism and science. So uh, we have been working with them for over a year, a year and a half. And yes, it's going pretty well. They are super confident now. They really enjoy doing it. We have been able to give them courses for first aid, they, they take a lot of capacitations about ecology, about sharks. They totally understand why we are doing this. And actually, like now, they are very worried about conserving the area, no? because they see the potential. They obviously understand that sharks and the nature itself is worth more alive than death. So now when we see, for example, a trawler in front of their town, they're like, no, like <laughs> we have to take them out. <laughs> So yeah, this is totally a different mindset now. And let's go back to day one, because I think a lot of us that have been in conservation for a while, there, there's a lot of layers to this. So you, you amazing ladies, decided that this is the community that we want to talk to and we want to approach. Can you take me back to that day or that week or, or when this whole thing started? Because I imagine I, I, having experience in my own work and sitting down with so many people, most people aren't receptive to strangers coming in and telling them that their way of life is wrong, which I understand too. I come from a, a, a very rural place myself. I, I understand if someone comes to me and be like, I'm sorry that your way of life is not correct. So, I mean, who wants to hear that? So take me back to square one. How exactly did you, did you guys approach this community? And, and how did you get them on board isn't really the right term, but to help them see the value of what they had, that it, they didn't just have to fish it, like they, they could use it in a more sustainable way. So how did that happen? How, what was day one? And then how did you get them, I guess, on board to this other way of life? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, starting from not judging them, and, and this is also related a lot from my previous two years of guiding. So I knew a lot of them already because I was using them as, as captains informally 
or or they saw me sometimes in the ocean. They knew my face, so I wasn't like coming out of nowhere. They already knew something about me. And also the name of our cat is also very related to the animal because in that uh, moment when we start going out and swimming uh, in the nature, it turns out that uh, during the pandemic, it was uh, very easy or often to get to find orcas in the area where they live. And as fishermen, they have been always super scared and afraid about the animal because the, uh, they have seen them for many years and many times. But there is a, a thing with the fishermen that the orcas can kill them or they can damage their boats. Mm. So every time they saw orcas, they were like running away from it. And then these 12 crazy ladies come <laughs> and try to, <laughs> and they say like, don't worry, this is fine. Like th they are the best animals. This is the best encounter. Like we love them. And like the, getting to see these ladies, super talented, like with cameras and drones and everything to get to swim with this animal, no? That is huge and super impressive. So I think that that way we connected with them and there was like a, like an admiration and and surprise kind of relationship like these girls are super brave like I, <laughs> I don't know them but they are doing something crazy and and yeah so it started from that and then also because we were not judging them we knew that they were doing something that probably could be very bad for the sharks and they knew that we love sharks but we all also understand the reality they are artisanal fishermen. They have been working like that for five generations. That's the only way th that they have been able to sustain their families. And we had to understand that. If you don't understand that, then it's really difficult to communicate because it's challenging for them. But the, obviously, if they had another option, they will do it. But they never had it. And they live in a desert, in a very, very isolated community. And it's not easy to work in industry or work or grow vegetables no it's the desert there is nothing else <laughs> so they have been always related to the ocean and they rely on it and and they were the ones that were selected to work just on shark fishing so it's very important to understand the difference between an artisanal fisherman and an industrial fishing because we always talk fishing in general but the, these guys are trying to work in and use very selective um, techniques so they create the, less, the least impact because they worry about the resources. While they see the industrial fishing boats outside of their town catching what they catch in one year, they mm. catch it in one night mm. with their huge net. So it's, it's not comparable. And in Mexico, they are allowed to do it because the Mexican law doesn't really regulate that area. Mm. So they just see the impact and they see the reduction of the species. They see how sharks are not doing pretty well. And that's how like, they saw it as an opportunity. If we don't take it now and we don't work with these girls, probably it's going to be too late. And next year, probably we don't have enough money from catching sharks because they, they, they see the, the effect of, of all this reduction. No? So I think we came just at the right time and we had the right approach and we still are learning a lot of things. Like probably through the uh, months and now the years, we are learning how to make it more successful and they are also like teaching us a lot of things, no? They are true naturalists and they know all the species, they know how to approach a lot of these species they know the seasonality and everything. So we have been learning a lot. Wow, that's incredible. Yes. I, just, I just really love how you how you brought that up about, you know, this is the only thing that they had was shark fishing. That's what they've been doing for five generations. And I think that sometimes just comparing it to like land based ecosystems too, like it's the same thing, like, we have a lot of people that do go hunt and they've been doing it for many generations. And that's one of the ways that they feed their families and, and all of these other dynamics that I think that we really forget when we just take out the human part, when we're just advocating for the wildlife. And, and sometimes we really have to remember about the human aspect here. Yeah. They don't have any other option. They live in a desert. And I'm sure when their ancestors started shark fishing five generations ago, that was the best opportunity 
and that gets passed down from family to family. Like if you inherit a family farm or you inherit all these other things that maybe as seen in conservation isn't up to par anymore, but that's, that's, that's not fair. Like that's just not fair to look at it that way. And so to hear that you came in with this other option sounds like it was almost a godsend for them, which is incredible. So let's talk about that more now. The, The building this ethical tourism, it sounds like you ladies came in at the right time for yeah. this opportunity to to have a new income that was also sustainable. So how, I guess one, when you first brought this idea to the community, what was their reaction? It sounds like they had already seen you guiding, which maybe, maybe you had already planted some seeds, maybe a little bit. So if this exactly. wasn't, doesn't sound like this is coming completely out of the blue, but yeah. for someone who traditionally knows one way of life, this might be like, oh, what do you mean? How do we build nature-based tourism? So how have you approached this? How do you start to build an ethical tourism business essentially from the ground up that doesn't previously exist. So how have you, could you mind just taking us through how how do you do this? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think some of them already work as captains for tourism before. So Mm. they had some experience, but not all of them. And it was important for, for them to, to start like, they they know the ocean very well and they drive and they they go out every day sometimes they to to be able to catch sharks they have to travel 30 miles oh wow uh, from shore so yeah because sharks are decreasing so much that it's really difficult to find them so you have to go very very far from shore to be able to catch them and when we were talking about it they were like well yes i i'm happy and i want to be part of it but I don't know how to like work on this. This is something really new for me. So at first we focus on snorkeling, like more, it's called it like sea safaris or pelagic safaris that basically is the same as going to Africa, but you go to the ocean, open to, you know, have like a very specific schedule of the areas that you are going to visit because we are focused more into pelagic species. So the pelagics can be everywhere <laughs> <laughs> and you go out and, and, and see what you find. No? Sometimes we get to see a large aggregation of modular rays or dolphins or um, some sharks, any kind of things. And sometimes, um, so it was easier for them to start doing that because they know the area pretty well. So they know where the animals are aggregated. And also snorkeling was something easy for them because basically they had to take care of us, but we we're always in the surface. So it's a lot about like go slower, approach them in a different way and learning, no? But it it, it is a process that takes time, but they were very compromised to to learn it. And it was so natural for them. So once they understand the first time, it was just improving and improving, like how to handle cameras or how to keep the the boat like tight, things like that. But it's very easy for them to do it. It was more challenging to learn how to take people out for diving. Scuba diving was Mm -hmm. something scary for them because they were like, wait, you are going to be out. (laughs) You are going to be down there for 45 minutes and I have to find you. And they were kind of nervous, like, no, I don't, I don't want to do it. Maybe if you get lost and I'm like, no, don't worry. We are going to do it first in shallow waters and you will see the bubbles. And I, I'm going to put my buoy, my surface marker in the surface. So it's going to be very easy. I'm not going to let uh, the divers drift a lot. I'm going to be here. And when they start like seeing it now, pff, they are super good like sometimes they are like Frida I knew that there was another group of divers but I knew that you don't go that way so I follow you and I just (laughs) come back to the surface and the boat is next to me it's like super super good because they like once they understand the patterns and see the bubbles and see what they have to look for then it's super easy for them so yeah it's creating this confidence on themselves now they ask us that they want to learn English because wow. they want to communicate with with the with the people, no? And they because every time they hear a lot of uh, words in English, I think they are already understanding some, and sometimes they try to talk and try to to communicate. 
But yeah, the the guide, the person that is with them is super important now because the person is explaining them. He is currently a fisherman, but he's working on this and he's making this effort. He has been taking all these courses and he's, he's here to explain us and tell us all about his place. And people obviously understand it and they are super happy and, and they create relationships with the people that is coming very often. So it's really cool to see them like, oh, yeah, welcome back. And, you know, <laughs> like creating these, these friendships with them. Wow, that's incredible. It sounds like yeah. the, like the the momentum is really starting, which is yeah, yeah. Ah, that's beautiful. So I'm also from from the other side of this, I guess if someone's listening right now or or even me, just out of curiosity, is the I guess I don't want to word this question. Is this is the organization of like the actual tourism side? Is that through your NGO or is it a business that is owned in the community that people go to and hire tours from that? I guess what is the setup there? If someone's like, I want to go on a dive experience with this awesome community, where do I actually go to do that? How do I do that? Mm -hmm. At the moment, it's still being managed through us because at the beginning, they didn't have chance to get clients, no? Because mm -hmm. they were not working on that. They didn't, some of them don't use social media and stuff. They are start working on their own business and some of them already invest on like their own boats. Oh, we're nice. also fundraising for getting them boats for, for, the, for the project. But yes, for now, uh, when people is interested, they can contact Orcas by Instagram, and we we set the trip with them. And yes, basically, you go out and you get to to see all these species and interact with them. So for now, is is through Orcas. I think in the future, because we just don't want to focus on one community, we want this to get expanded to at least all the region, no? At least in in Baja. So at some point, probably we are going to uh, let them do it by themselves. They have to learn all this process. And, and at some point, obviously, we, are, we want to come back and, and see how they are doing it and not leave them alone, but that they have to be independent, no? And they have to take all this process by themselves and being able to do all the steps to, to be able to be independent. So, yeah. That that will be the idea in the near future. For now, it has a lot uh, involved in the legal aspect of it because in Mexico, if you want to operate as a tourist operator, you need to go through a lot of steps. No, so you need, for example, your libertad de mar is like your driving lines for for boats. So it's a it's a very complicated process to get it, and they they we are taking them through that process too. Uh, they they need the boat has to be with some kind of safety conditions and and obviously they cannot use their fishing boats to do that so it's also a very long process <laughs> but but they are into it and they are like sometimes we're like okay you have to go to take this healthcare um, or this health test in order to get this document and they have to drive to La Paz and do it and they are super compromised. They are always on time, like they take it super seriously. So that's also very rewarding for us. <laughs> oh, wow. This is, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love this. I love, I love coming in and meeting the people, like people like you that are doing the work right now. We are literally mm -hmm. in the middle of this incredible project that you're building and as we go through the years, we'll be able to sit back down and like, what's the latest yeah. update? And and of course, I'm already going to plant the seed here and I'm going to keep planting the seed. I have every intention of coming down and seeing <laughs> you. So, yeah. I mean, coming down to La Paz and then and down to where you are, that's like, that's like the easiest international trip I can do. So mm -hmm. anyone wants to come join me, I want <laughs> to go do this. So yeah. <laughs> let's go. But okay. So, and then, yeah, we could even do live updates, but that's, that's way <laughs> down the rabbit hole. We need to focus still on this conversation. Yeah. I just get so excited about it, <laughs> but let's, so, so you, you are a master of science. And from what you explained to me the last time we sat down that you, your main role in orgas or sorry, is the science side of this, like the research yeah. side of project shark. So 
are you starting to see any difference? Is it still too early? Are sharks coming back? I, I guess, yeah, what what are you finding from this this really exciting and kind of fast switch into more of of a you know non-consumptive sustainable way of being with sharks versus fishing are you seeing any difference yet i think yeah well just as as an introduction when we start talking with donors about all the project they were like yeah it sounds really cool but you have to measure the effort you have to see the results of all that change no so we created this project for a baseline so basically we want to select five seven species uh, not just sharks, but other species that are important for them and see and assess them and see how they are doing now. So in the future, when they stop uh, and reduce the effort of fishing and we probably create a, some kind of a reserve or any kind of management protection for the area, we can see the effect of all that effort now. And, and yeah, basically we start using the broths, the same techniques that I use for my PhD. To, to be able to to show and assess the population. So we have seen for so far that the area is very diverse, that we have a very important population for dorados, marlin. Uh, we have found uh, sunfish that are very, very poorly described in the area. Obviously, we have some encounters with orcas. Yesterday, we saw orcas again. Oh, really? That's <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Tons of dolphins, whales many different species of sharks so it's a pretty diverse area and we are trying to find these as as again these hotspots of diversity no areas that potentially in the future could create the no-take or the core area for a future marine reserve so if we understand how the diversity is doing in this place probably it will be we we are setting this information as a background for something in the future so yeah, it's, it's going pretty well. They understand it very clearly. And before they were kind of afraid that by creating this information and providing this data, they will be affected. But they are now they get that confidence of understanding why we do it. And we also are very realistic that we work with one community, but we still have many others that are not doing that well still because they never had the opportunity to work and collaborate on this. So we cannot take drastic changes from one place and having one example to generalize it for the whole region. No? So yeah, it's a long process, but yeah, it's setting an example for something that can be also replicated in other countries or in other places with other NGOs. So we we work a lot collaborating with other groups, with the university, with other NGOs, to be able to take people out and to see it and and have bigger goals, no? If, yeah. if it were just me or just the orcas uh, without collaborators, it will be really hard because it's a big and ambitious goal. But if we have collaborators that are uh, happy to help us to do all this together, it's way more powerful. Absolutely. And I, I this might even be a loaded question considering how entrenched in, in depth you are and everything but what is the next step for you and for orcas like what what do you plan on tackling next or is it just steering the ship as you're going and building further or what is what's next on or maybe like your, what's your big goal for 2023 or something like that what what do you hope to really tackle next well in the area we have a very ambitious project that is create a huge marine reserve that covers basically the whole shore from Baja California Sur from the Pacific side to the Gulf of California. And that will uh, still allow artisanal fishing, but will take the industrial fishing away from this area. Mm. Because we understand the importance. We, we know that this area is super uh, rich and it has a lot of resources, but it has been very strongly impacted by the industrial fishing. So if the local artisanal fisher uh, fishermen understand the value of protecting it and understand uh, the benefits that they can get from preserving it, they can be the ones that help us to stop the industrial fishing to impact the area. So that's that's what <laughs> is very ambitious. Uh, but the current president of Mexico is very a lot into like social programs 
and poor people, which is important. But if the fishermen are the ones that talk and say, we don't think this is fair, this is something that we feel is our resource and we know how to take care of it and we help them to do it, then I think we can create big changes in the area. Wow. Yeah, especially when it's their voices, raising local voices. Because it is them. I mean, it is at the end of the day, that's their home. And if everything is completely taken away, if all the sharks are gone, if the orcas are gone, if the dolphins are gone, they have nothing left. So there is a lot on the line at the end of the day. I mean, yeah, your your organization, it would be so, so sad, but you could go to a different community and help them build. But for the people that are there, I mean, this is this is whether or not they can continue living in their home. So that's huge. So mm. hopefully they do with your encouragement and, and help go to the Mexican government and be like, look, this is ours. Get these freaking fisher boats <laughs> out of here. I'm done looking yeah. at them and taking our sharks. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that is wonderful. Okay, my next question is, I'm going to switch it back to you. And yeah. I love asking this one since... All, all of my guests, everyone that comes on this show, you all do amazing, incredible, crazy things. And I love to ask, is there a particular story or encounter that was wild and out of this world from when you were in the field? Like, what is the first thing that comes to mind when I ask that question? <laughs> I would love to hear this story. Well, uh, last year, yeah, it was last year. Yes, I, I was in Revilla Gijedo. I was invited by some sailors to go in their trimaran to sail to Revi. Uh, we didn't, didn't have a lot of resources, but we were like, yeah, let's go and see what we can find, create an educational campaign, get some photos and get some ideas for the park. And we were there for two weeks. And every time I go to Socorro, if I get to see a tiger shark, the trip is like, it's complete. <laughs> so for two weeks, I I, de- I didn't have the chance to see tigers. So I was like waiting, waiting, waiting for the moment to, to get to see them. And in the last dive, we were in boiler in one of the one of the, my favorite dive sites. And then we had one huge humpback just circling around us. That <gasps> it was the first time I was seeing a humpback whale diving. And that was super, super beautiful, very special. 25 minutes playing and like dancing around us. And it was mind blowing. And after that, uh, we found like five, six uh, yellowfin tunas in the blue. And we're with the buoy, you know, because we were drifting in the blue. And uh, followed by the tuna, a huge tiger shark (gasps) in the blue. And I was like, yes, finally, like celebrating with my friend. And I was taking photos and everything. And I think she felt kind of in bed in a way that we were following her. And probably the shark never saw humans before. Like it's not very common to, to be drifting that far from the dive site. And she wasn't happy. So we could see the whole transformation from like just passing through to start like circling us and start like putting the fins down and haunching behavior. So she was doing a display of like feeling very uncomfortable. And that was the first time, uh, even that I've been diving with sharks many, many, many times, that I felt kind of scared. Like, this is not the right thing. <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, okay, if, if I know how to react, I just have to be, you know, like secure and, and think body language, you know, visual contact and everything but she was getting closer and closer and secret and sala around and and at some point she opened the mouth and moved the head side to side like <laughs> like a real tiger and that's when i look to my friend and we we're like super scared like we thought that that was it like she, the next thing she will do was to come and try to approach us so at the end of the of the dive she left and we were able to come back to the surface and as the captain to pick us up super fast, he saw his wife's face and he took her with the tank and everything back in the boat in two seconds. Like, <laughs> And my friend, in, to be able to help me, he took his VCD out and left it in the surface. So he was able to jump in and help me with my camera and my gear. 
And once we got in the boat, he realized that his dive gear was drowning because <laughs> one of the valves got stuck and all the air went out and basically just drowned his BCD, his tank and the regulator. And we couldn't get it back. <laughs> oh my but gosh. We were very happy that nothing else happened and we're complete <laughs> with all our body parts. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. yeah, it was it was a very interesting experience because in that trip I was feeling like I I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a guide or work especially just in tourism or like all these years of education were not used for anything else, you know? I was in that moment of life and I think in that dive, seeing the whale first was like so significant for me to say like, yes, but when you do these kind of things, you are lucky enough to experience these moments. Mm -hmm. And you value it to be able to show it to other people why these species are important. So it's your responsibility to be able to be there. And then with the tiger, I think it made me feel very like exposed and small. So you also, like it takes all your egos away because yeah. you know nature is much more powerful and you have to understand that, no? That any, like especially sharks are not predictable. So you always have to be aware. And yeah, it was, it was very special. <laughs> Wow, that does sound like a life-changing day. And it sounds yeah. like it was a pivotal <laughs> moment for you too. Yeah. Ooh, wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's incredible. I can't imagine a hunching tiger shark at me. <laughs> like that sounds <laughs> wow. But yeah. Oh, that's why I would be going with you, who is a shark expert, and tell me <laughs> what to do. So no, yeah. I'm not gonna do that on my own. Mm. And probably but, she never had the like the intention of attacking us but she was just being curious and like showing mm -hmm. us that she wanted some respect no and and sometimes it's also that that we have to understand that even that we get to see wildlife and we are there we have to respect their own space um and yeah to be yeah to to always be aware and respect and understand why they are there and is their own home no and we are just visitors yeah, absolutely. I've I've been several places now, even with really great guides. Sometimes the animal is just not feeling it and you will get mock charges. I mean, sometimes I don't want people around me and just like get yeah. out of here. And it's a little different when that species has a lot of teeth or is really <laughs> powerful. <laughs> yeah, it's a little. Yeah. Yeah. The stakes are a little higher if, if you piss one of them off. Um, exactly. But yeah, I mean, there's. I can't imagine a mock charging. I don't know if it's if it's also called that when it comes to sharks or or anything like that. <laughs> like like a shark that's displaying aggressive behavior yeah. or uh, you know just even mock charges from elephants. Like they, they are not common, but man, whoo! Yeah, your heart rate goes up a lot. Or just looking, you know, when that tiger looks you, an actual tiger, you know, like <laughs> looks you in the face. You're know, like, yeah. oh god! And, like the <laughs> hair sticks up on the back of your neck. It's they're incredible experiences that I would never, I would never change for the world. But yeah, you, you just gave up, you just gave us some like incredible stories and you've done so much. And it sounds like you've also had a couple moments that were trying to you and that you had to work through to figure out what is my why. And since you have gone through that stuff and, and you have, you go on the other side of that and you are pursuing some incredible things. What advice or message do you have to anyone listening that you would like to share? Well, I, I was just talking today with a friend that uh, as an underwater photographer, I think we have to find a message and we have to find a, an intention and really, really trying to help what we, are, what we love. Because nowadays I feel like social media is creating a problem uh, we we are trying to use tourism as a way of conservation but if we don't understand the species and we don't respect them we can create another problem mm. so yeah it's is perfectly valid to to show the beauty of nature and why we have to protect it but we have to have that message and we also have to be very sensitive about 
what we do in order to get that shot or how we use that information in order to to really help that species no if it's not really helping the species and it's more about the attention that you get or the the your benefit either economic or fame or whatever then we are twisting a little bit the message no and and i think we have to keep that all the time on mind because otherwise we are impacting the communities. We are teaching them things that are not right. <laughs> and I'm super worried about it, especially in Baja, where we see that we are in that moment of creating different mindsets, but the mindset can be wrong too. So we have, as, as a person that has the experience and the knowledge, we have to be responsible of creating uh, better messages. Absolutely. I completely agree with that, which is the whole basis of the show. It's it's all about the message and what, you know, each of you come on to share with us and from your years of knowledge. And I completely agree with you when it comes to social media and being very careful about what we post uh, any of us in wildlife, because there's so many times like I'll see a, a video that pops up on my feed that has like over a million views and it's completely unethical and just blatantly obvious for someone like you and me who does this but for someone who's just your casual consumer they don't know any different it looks like an incredible experience like oh my gosh I want to do that and whoever posted it is then just perpetrating this bad image and the way that the animals are being affected and conservation in general and it's just the wrong message so I completely agree with that and why I always feel that anyone who's making a difference for conservation should be on the show. And I'm very selective as well. Not everyone's opinion I agree with, but that's okay. That's absolutely okay. Just as long as the message and what they're doing doesn't cause any harm. Um, but it is, there is a lot of harmful things out there and being in a, an ecosystem like that, like I don't, I don't know anything about how to properly be in the ocean. So I am reliant on someone like you or other communities to make sure that I'm doing it properly too. So Completely agree. <laughs> but okay, so those are all of my questions. And I had so much fun sitting down with you. Mm -hmm. And I always love to ask, like, maybe someone listening really wants to book a trip with you or see what you're up to, or maybe read more about your incredible research. So how can someone I mean, of course, I'll have all of this in the show notes, as I always <laughs> do. But if you could please say how can someone get a hold of you, maybe follow orcas and and yeah, and all the things yes yes so yeah i use a lot instagram and my email so if someone wants to contact me to share some ideas or projects or or if they want to come and see it by themselves is they are always welcome and yes so i'm very happy and thank you very much for inviting me it was fun to to share all this with you and as i was telling you in the in the call before I think it's imp very important that people understand that it's not just me or it's, it's a team, no? So the team is formed by these really, really talented girls that are doing an awesome job, in, either in law or like a financial part and all this managing of like fundraising and and the communication part. So it's, it's a very, very uh, special team of people working and obviously the fishermen. Without, without them, this project will not be su successful. So just, just to, to understand that if we want to really create a change, we have to always like work between each other. And even if sometimes we are not agree in the way that some things are done, we have to always look for the big picture and, and see that the results are sometimes more important than our opinions. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We got to take the ego out of it. And I think going in, all of us have pretty strong egos, like we're going to save the world. And then yes. we're all humbled very fast and realize that it's about true connection. It's going to take a village. It's going to take a planet in order to keep all of our species here. So Frida, thank you for your work you. and all the ladies and orcas. Please tell them all thank you. We really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. I am so inspired by Frida and everything orcas has done to help sharks and local communities. 
Don't be surprised if you see more media about Frida and Orcas in the near future. Hint, hint. <laughs> If you have a question for Frida about shark conservation or anything else you'd like to know, drop a comment on this episode's post on the Rewatologist Facebook page. As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the Rewatology community. If you'd like to support the show, some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewatology newsletter at Rewatology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at Rewatology.com or purchase a piece of swag like this one I have right on for those watching <laughs> to show off your Rewatology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewatology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.